Right. So, bad at context. So, why do, why do psychologists care about furries? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who sees the face in this car? Yay! Okay. So, this is anthropomorphization. This is seeing human traits in other things. And I want to know do furries do this for everything? When furries anthropomorphize animals, do they also have to provide their toaster and their car and their computer? Yeah. And what you find is yeah. that it's actually pretty specific to animals. Uh, when you look at furries and anthropomorphization, they tend to do it predominantly for animals. This isn't the idea that they see a face in absolutely everything they look at. Uh, in terms of, do furries, are furries people who consider themselves to be animals? This is another one. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, for the previous slide, how is that data determined? How is that determined? So we asked for it on a 1 to 10 scale, or 1 to 7, one to seven scale, uh, whether or not they tended to anthropomorphize these things. So do you treat your vehicle, do you talk to your vehicle, do you treat your vehicle like a person? Uh, what about computers, stuffed animals, electronics, appliances, etc., etc.? Yes? Just a quick question. Was it only a one-item scale? Pardon me? Was it an only a one-item scale? Uh, for each of these items, separately, yes. For, for space constraints, it's difficult to do you know, five items for each of these. We can talk about the logistics of doing the studies uh, afterwards. A very good question. So, uh, are various people who consider themselves to be animals? This is another one that the media commonly misrepresents uh, and says, that, oh, furries are people who think they're animals. Um, there's a subset of the furry fandom known as Therians who are more likely to believe that they, uh, identi they identify with animals, not necessarily physically, but the idea is usually encapsulated in I have um, the spirit of an animal within me, or psychologically I identify with sort of the mindset uh, of an animal. We find that about 17% of people in the furry fandom also identify as Therian. Uh, in terms of when we ask furries, do you consider yourself to be 100% human? Are you entirely human? We found that non-furries, when we ask the average person in day-to-day -day life, 7% uh, of the average American said that they don't feel 100% human. About 35% of furries said yes, and about 86% of Therians said yes to this. So you can see that it's much more prevalent, uh, these beliefs in people who <coughs> self-identify as Therians. In terms of would you become 0% human if you could, would you become entirely not human, we find again that the average non-furry, only 10% of people said that they would become not human if they could. About 40% of furries said that they would, and about 59% of Therians said that they would become not human if they could. So it doesn't seem to be the case that furries are these people who are convinced that they're not animals. This is not a defining trait of what it means to be furry. And among those who identify as Therians, the vast majority of them, when asked, don't believe physically that they are, so it's not a hallucination thing, it's not that they look down and see paws, it's that they believe it's a spiritual thing or a, a psychological mindset. Uh, of an animal. Again, not in every case, but in the majority of cases that we study. Uh, do furries engage in sort of magical or fantastic thinking? Uh, we find that compared to non-furries, so the average American, furries are more likely to have magical or spiritual, na spirit supernatural <laughs> beliefs. Uh, they're more likely to experience more vivid mental imagery. So when you close your eyes and you picture something, furries tend to picture more vivid images than non-furries do. Furries are more likely to have hyper, um, hypersensitive senses, so senses where they, they hear sounds as more loud, more intense than the average person. Uh, and they report uh, more visual hallucinations than non-furries do. Now that said, taken together, these sound like this is kind of pathological. This sounds like something you would associate with perhaps schizophrenia. But what we actually find is that these things aren't associated with pathology in the furry fandom. Furries experience more of these things than non-furries, but it doesn't seem. <laughs> but, it doesn't, but it doesn't seem to be the case that furries are, are are crazy when it comes to this stuff. Furries, when they use fantasy, they don't delude themselves. They don't experience hallucinations. They're more likely to entertain these as fun little ideas. Uh, they use it to cope with stress in their lives. They retreat to to fantasy worlds uh, to sort of cope with stress in their life. They use it for self-expression. They turn to art, and they use some of this fantasy to express parts of themselves. They use it for recreational purposes. When it comes to psychological disorders, are furries damaged people? Are furries people who we have to try to explain with some kind of psychological disorder? We've looked at a number of different disorders, including medical disorders, psychiatric medication, and the use of the use of it to treat some kind of disorder. Uh, ADHD, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> 
anxiety disorders, mood disorders, and furries do not differ from the general population on any of these things. Furries aren't people who have some condition that need to explain. The only thing we found some evidence for is the fact that Asperger's syndrome is a little bit more prevalent, about twice as prevalent in the furry fandom than it is in the general population. That is to date the only thing that we've seen to find so far that happens more in the furry fandom than in the general population. What was the sample size? For this one we had 800 average Americans and I think we had about 1,200 furries. Uh, yes? Why are you more attended to the dance, I mean, than the, uh, all the entertainment that the uh, con is providing? I mean, the rhubarb show... His furries are intelligent and like education. <laughs> in a scale that they might find out their diagnosis or something on because then we can't use an anonymous survey because if we find out, hey, you have autism, we have to be able to get a hold of you. Uh, so what we instead do is we ask furries, have you ever been diagnosed with a psychological condition? So we don't say, do you think you have? We say, have you ever been diagnosed with a condition? Uh, in terms of social awkwardness, we do find uh, the furry fandom is no more socially awkward at least than convention going anime fans or fantasy sport fans. Uh, same can't be said for online anime community. <laughs> um, what's interesting is you find that furries are sort of distinct in being bullied significantly more than the average person. Oh. Oh. This, is, this is my way of sort of cutifying some really sad data. Oh. <laughs> so we find that about 62% of furries say that they were significantly bullied in, in high school, in elementary school, as compared to only 40% of the general population. Uh, they, most furries have endured some form of physical bullying, some form of teasing, and this is after controlling for the fact that furries are also more likely to be gay, because being gay is also associated with an experienced stigmatization uh, in high school, but even when you control for that, furries still take a lot of flack. Um, so the question is, are furries stigmatized? And we were actually asked this by a psychological journal in one of the papers we tried to publish. They said, proof that furries experience stigma. So we did. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too hard to find it out there. All right, then. Yes? Have you found any correlation between furries being bullied and that increased fantasy? Oh, God, I just see it. I feel like I've looked at it at one point. I can't tell you off the top of my head. I don't remember what the results are. So, if you find me off an email, I can redo that analysis and tell you. That's a good question. Um, so we also ask furries, do you feel like the world around you disapproves of you? And we find that more so than anime fans and fantasy sport fans, furries were more likely to say that, yeah, I feel like the world around me would disapprove if they found out that I was a furry. Okay. And we found out that there's some truth to this. So we asked furries and other groups, how do you feel about furries? Furries feel pretty positive about furries. Um, and to their credits, to their credits uh, convention-going anime fans tend to also higher than midpoint for how they feel about furries. 50 was neutral. Um, online anime fans didn't feel so positively about furries, and uh, fans of sport fans are kind of jerks. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay, we hate sports anyway, so. <laughs> and now in the comments section of this one is posted on YouTube will be a whole bunch of really angry sport fans. <laughs> and their mascot. Yeah. Their mascots are also furry. Um, and to sort of corroborate this as well, we also found that in addition to sort of feeling that the world around them doesn't treat furries very nicely, we find that furries are the least likely of this group to tell other people that they are furries. So put another way, furries are the most likely to keep it a secret to themselves, to not tell their family, to not tell their co-workers, to not tell other people in their lives that they are a furry. And our research suggests that this is a decidedly bad thing. This is a decidedly bad thing. Uh, so research shows, for example, that research on, on people who are gay find that keeping it to yourself, uh, not coming out of the closet, keeping, keeping it from your friends and family leads to anxiety because you're constantly on edge about wondering, you know, are people going to find out, you know, what if I let it slip at work, what if I accidentally say my, my boyfriend instead of my girlfriend, 
And this kind of chronic anxiety leads to things like, you know, more likely to experience heart attacks, more likely to have a weakened immune system, more likely to be under constant psychological stress. So, and the same thing happens with furries. The more you keep this to yourself, the less likely you are to self-disclose, the more likely it is to have this detrimental effect on your health. Um, one paper that we recently started, and I, I told this story last year, I believe, but for those who haven't heard it, um, we wanted to make an argument uh, based on some focus group data we had done at Opencon for furries who had come to us and said that the furry fandom was a source of support for them where counselors weren't. So um, even though furries don't experience more depression or more anxiety than the general population, there are still furries with depression, there are still furries with general anxiety disorder, and so they go to counseling psychologists. So these furries who had experienced some kind of you know, uh, negative events in their life, they would turn to furries in the furry fandom who provide them with a sense of sort of belonging, a sense of counseling, and sometimes they would say, go to a psychologist and get some help. So they would go to these psychologists and try to get help, and the psychologist would sit them down and say, okay, well, tell me the problem, and they would say, I think I have depression, and they'd say, okay, well, tell me some more about yourself, and this furry would say, well, now I'm a furry, and they would say, hold that thought, Google furry, you go, that's your problem. Aww. Aww. And for furries, for whom this is the only good thing going on in their lives, if they're experiencing depression, if they were bullied growing up, and this is the only good thing in their lives, that's a really brutal thing to hear from your counselor. To your counselor say, you have to stop it with this furry crap. And so we wrote a paper and sent it to a counseling psychology journal saying, hey, this is furry, we're the furry researchers, this is a thing, you need to start taking this seriously because you're losing clients. You're having people who are depressed saying that you're telling them to, to cut out the only thing in their life that's stopping them from doing something horrible. And the one line response we got from this journal was that it's unprofessional of you to waste our time like this. Wow. Oh. So Which kind of makes the point. Thankfully, we told them to kind of shove it and went to a different journal. Yes. Who was much more positive in their response? So it's been published. So it's yeah. so it out there now. So thankfully, when a, when a, when a counseling psychologist types in, in, in furry into the psychological literature, they'll find something at least telling counseling psychologists how they should address this problem. Yes? Which journal was published in? The actual uh, publication or the one that it was rejected from? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to say the name of the one that it was rejected from because the last thing we need is to have 5,000 angry furries. Vengeance! <laughs> <laughs> As for the journal. Oh, damn, what's the name of the journal? Um, Only 5,000 angry furries? <laughs> on YouTube. Uh, get, to me get to me after the um, after the talk. I can't remember off the top of my head the name of the journal. My colleague was the first author on that one. She was the one that dealt with all the correspondence. I can't remember off the top of my head. But I do have the name of the journal. I can get it to you. Uh, and so the upside, uh, based on this furry psychological research, uh, is the fact that despite the fact that a lot of furries experience significant bullying, significant stigma uh, growing up, they don't seem to show any detrimental effects. Furries tend to be pretty comparable to everyone else when it comes to life satisfaction, when it comes to things like self-esteem. This thing that should have screwed them up, this idea that bullying in childhood has been shown to have a detrimental effect, doesn't seem to be having the detrimental effect we would expect it to be having. So maybe that's the truth of the idea that friendship is magic. <laughs> and I worked a pony reference as well. And not just on your sense of, sort of self-esteem and well-being, but we also find that being a furry seems to be associated as well with having a strong, coherent sense of identity, a sense of who you are. Furries spend a long time thinking about these issues. Who am I? How do I best represent myself? How do I express myself to other people? Furries have a clearer sense of who I am than non-furries do. Uh, so the point of all of this is to say that furries are weird. No one is going to deny that furries are weird and they're eclectic. But it's not necessarily a bad thing to be weird. Happy birthday! A lot of things make furries unique compared to other groups, but dysfunction isn't one of them.